Uh, it's my privilege to preach to us about money today. I'm going to do the slides here, if that's okay, Caesar, if you or Max, if you don't mind. I'm going to take over here from you. Money and giving. Just tell your neighbor, how do you feel about uh, talking about money? Are you excited to talk about money? You'd rather not? Before we get into it, um, let me give us a quick update about what's happening uh, in our churches in the Ukraine. Okay, one of the incredible privileges of, of this situation, um, of us being a family of churches around the world, is that we have so many good connections. Uh, in the Ukraine, we have seven churches. We have a church in Moscow. We have a church in Krakow, Poland. So a lot of where this is going on, we've got a lot of first-hand information. We get daily updates uh, of what's going on. Um, now, we want to continue praying for the Ukraine by no stretch of imagination um, is, is this thing anywhere near over. We want to continue praying for Russia. We want to continue praying for Poland. Um, and you might have heard some good things. You might have heard some bad things. I know there have been some reports of some refugees being treated better than others uh, and that there's some racial tensions even as refugees are trying to cross borders and some get preference over others. And so these are the sorts of things we want to be praying into, not just for the war to cease, but as uh, God's kingdom advances and as help is put out there and people are received, that really the heart of God is displayed in all of this and that all people are equal. Okay, I, we want to be praying along those lines, but um, I want to just share a few testimonies at this stage um, of what's happening there. Our churches in the Ukraine are really focusing on three main things at the moment. Um, that's transportation, number one, transporting people to the border, to the Polish border. Um, this is one of our church members from Lviv, and he is driving constantly. For three days, he's been going back and forth, taking women and children to the border to help them get across out of the Ukraine. Um, they are getting people in the West. They are driving all the way to the Western border and picking women and children up over there, bringing them back to the East, helping them, giving them food, giving them a place to sleep, and then taking them to the border uh, in the, sorry, the other way around from the east to the west. Um, but they are fetching people in the war zone. They are literally, our church members, people like you and I, are getting into buses and they're driving into the war zone and they're picking up, sold, uh, they're picking up refugees, they pick women and children, and they're taking them out of the conflict zone, which is absolutely incredible. So that's one thing we're doing. Um, and I say we because the money that you give to this church, to Every Nation Slough, is making that happen. This is why we're talking about money today. Uh, another thing that they're doing is supplies. You might have heard that there's no food, there's no water left in those war zones. So they're taking a lot of supplies over there to make sure the people that are staying behind have enough to live by. So that's an incredible thing. They, they fill the vans with supplies, then they take them into the conflict zone, then they unload all of that, put people in, and come back. It's just absolutely incredible. Um, but then they're also um, housing people in our church buildings. So they've created these refuge centers in the church buildings where people come, they sleep, um, both in the Ukraine and in Poland, um, and just help people get on their feet so here's a quick video that I want to share with us. This is from, we, we met Pastor Igor, if you were here last week, or if you watched this online, Pastor Igor from Lviv and Pastor Olek from Ternopil, they're both in here, but also Przemek from Krakow, Poland, in this video, just giving a little bit of an update uh, of what's happening there. Well, first of all, I would like to, to make a chance and thank everybody who are deeply touched by support of our global family. We're grateful for your prayers and we feel them. And thank you for financial support. We have been using them actively. 
we changed our facility into refugee camp and we can receive up to 200 refugees in our building. As soon as our church members filled their homes, we started filling our church venue. We put mattresses on floor. We have a little kitchen, shower, toilets, everything. My home turned into a, a call center. Our church people are on the standby, going to bus station at 2, 4 a.m. sometimes to look for people they, they, they had never met. Our city gathered on the first day 150 tons of supplies for Lviv. We've been praying that in all this chaos, Holy Spirit would overcome the chaos and arrange and link people so the resources would not be wasted but would make the biggest possible impact. And we've been seeing stories that seems like God is answering our prayers. I really am praying for blessings and uh, revival coming out of the situation. There are 16 young guys from our churches here, a lot of healing churches that have been drafted to the army and go to fight to the front. Even though there is terrible physical suffering, this is spiritual battle. In times like these, you can tell the difference between being part of an organization or being a part of a spiritual family. We know this is not a simple war, this is spiritual war as well for the heart and soul of people. And we believe a God has special place in his heart for Ukraine. Amen. It's good, right? You know, at the heart of this ministry, at the heart of what these guys are doing and so many others out there, the thing that's really fueling this ministry is generosity. It's giving, it's people giving their lives, literally giving their lives to the cause uh, to change their world, but also people giving money to change this situation. You know, in the last week, in the last seven days, our European churches have given more than 20,000 pounds to the Ukraine Relief Fund. And that money is going into the hands of the people that need it the most and is literally changing the world. Friends, this is what I would like us to talk about today these next 25 minutes, this is the one point that I want us to get from the scripture today. Hopefully, this is a real revelation to you that giving changes the world. Our giving, God's giving, changes the world. And this is just, this is just a, a one example of that, what can happen when we understand generosity when we understand giving. This is part of our uh, Abide series. We're finishing our series called Abide today. We've been talking about this from the start of the year, the beauty and power of God's Word. Now we, as followers of Jesus, like to refer to the Bible as God's Word. But even more than that, the Bible refers to Jesus as the Word. The Word became flesh, and of, and of course, Jesus is revealed through the Scripture here. But when we get into this book, uh, and when the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, starts to illuminate these things to us, it changes our lives. The Word is beautiful. The Word is powerful. This is, inc it's, this is not just ink on a page. You know, this is not just black and white. This, the, the Scripture says that it is alive and active, living and active that this can change us even today when we are open to receive what this says. It can change our lives and it can change the world around us. Now, if you're a follower of Jesus here today, you've got to get excited about that, okay? That, that we have this book. I like to remind us that 15 miles down the road here, 20 miles down the road here, people were burnt alive for translating this book into English. Yeah? Just around St. Paul's Cathedral there, there's, if you do a tour, there's a historic tour, a Christian historic tour, it's fantastic. It's heartbreaking. And it's incredible to see what people have done. Do you know that people were drowned because they started baptizing adults? They said, oh, you want to you wanna go underwater? We'll put you underwater. And they put weights on their feet and they sunk them to the bottom of the ocean. The Anabaptists. Re Friends, people have given their lives for what we have today. Let us not take it for granted. The power and the beauty of God's word, that we have this and that 
It's so precious. It can change our everyday lives. Now, you might be here today. You might be watching this online. You don't consider yourself a Christian. I just hope that you experience something of the presence and power of God today. Because this is not just empty words. These aren't just fancy stories. This is truth. And the proof is in the pudding. You can try some of this stuff and you can see if it makes a difference to your life. I guarantee you that it will. Jesus has changed my life and he's changed so many of us. Okay, just wave at me if Jesus changed your life. Because he's alive, he's living, he's, he's not dead, he's not in the grave anymore, he's resurrected, the tomb is empty. So as we get into this and as we finish our Abide series, please don't finish your devotion for abiding in the word. If anything, rejuvenate your commitment to this book because it's so precious, it's so powerful. The last message in this series is that the word unlocks generosity. We've looked at the word became flesh, that Jesus himself is the word that he's revealed through the scripture, that the word feeds our spirit. Okay, what, what we feed on is what we will hunger for. And if we feed on the right stuff, we're going to be more and more hungry for that. We've looked at the word sets us free. The word makes us fruitful. If we abide in him, if we abide in his word, we will become fruitful. We will be productive. Okay? Psalm 1 says that, that the man that meditates on this word, on God's law day and night, he prospers in everything he does. Come on, that's awesome. But today here, the word unlocks generosity. And for some of us, this might be a new understanding, a new revelation. For some of us, this is a reminder. But I'm trusting that this is going to help us today. Father, thank you for your presence. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you that we can be together as a church, that we can gather publicly without fear of persecution. Father, I thank you that we come to worship the living God. As we gather, you are in our midst. As we praise, you inhabit those praises. Awaken our hearts, Holy Spirit. Speak to us. Here we are, in Jesus' name. Amen. Just turn to your neighbor quickly and tell them, what was the last thing you spent a lot of money on? I'm looking at someone doing an extension at the moment. What was the last thing you spent a lot of money on? Just maybe you want to type that online. What was the last thing you spent a lot of money on? Let's hear some of those. A house. That's a lot of money. My, a oh well, we celebrate them. They just bought a house, just moved in a couple of weeks ago. Fantastic. Let me just say that if you think you'll never own a house, we want to believe with you to own a house in the United Kingdom, one of the most expensive places in the world to own a house. Uh, because we want to take property, advance God's kingdom in the physical, not just in the spirit. So it might seem like a pipe dream for you, but we want to believe with you for that. What else? Birthday party. Birthday party. <laughs> Was it yours, Freddie? Tembi. That's a, that's a good investment. One, two more? Extension. Extension. House extension, that's a lot of money. New shower room. New shower room. <laughs> shoes. <laughs> I thought you could only spend 25 pounds on shoes. <laughs> Good, guys, fantastic. Well, we're going to look at something very expensive today. John chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you can turn there or you can... Check this out on your phone. John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. The context here is that a religious man comes to Jesus and he's trying to understand what Jesus is teaching. It seems different to what he's used to. And so he comes in the night because he's kind of afraid what his religious friends will think. 
So he comes to Jesus in the night. His name is Nicodemus. And they have this conversation. And in the midst of the conversation, Jesus says these powerful things to him. Verse 16 and 17, Jesus says, For God so loved the world that he gave, say gave, gave. his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. but in order that the world might be saved through him. May that be our testimony as we share Jesus with people, that salvation will come out, but not condemnation. God did not send his son to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. You know, when God wanted to change the world, he gave. When he saw that the world was broken and that it needed help and that people were selfish and that they were separated from him and that their their deeds were wicked and evil, he gave. And he gave his best. He gave the highest that he could give. He gave his one and only son. He gave Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Prince of peace, to come into this earth to be born as a man, to live a perfect life, a sinless life, to die a brutal death on the cross, and to be raised from the dead. So that if you and I put our faith in Jesus, we don't have to die for our sin, because Jesus has already paid that penalty. That God put our Brokenness, our wickedness, our selfishness, our sin on Jesus, on that cross, and paid for it, punished Him in our place. So that we could receive His perfect life. We could receive His righteousness. That's what the Bible says. That we can become right with God, in right standing with God. That's absolute, that's the best news ever. Jesus lived the life I should have lived, and he died the death I should have died. And when we put our faith in him, we get that, friends. This was God's solution to the world, (laughs) was to give, and to give his son, that the brokenness of the world could come to an end. And so with that framework, I want us to think about three questions today as we think about giving, as we think about money, as we think about the Ukraine, and as we think about everything else that, 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 that costs something from us, is why do we give, what do we give, and how do we give? Why, what, and how? Now, we've really already answered the why question. We give because God has given. It is our response. If we understand that a lifetime of wrongdoing and of running away from God and choosing myself rather than Him can be swept away in one moment because of the loving kindness, the grace of God, when we simply believe in Jesus and receive what He has done for us. When you understand that, it unlocks in you, I want to respond. I want to give something back. This is how Romans 12 puts it. Romans 12, 1. I'm loving the New Living Translation at the moment. It says, So, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because, say because, because. of all He has done for you. Let me be, let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. So our giving is always a response. Okay, we talk about giving out of revelation here, and some people are like, well, what does that mean? It means that we understand why we give. We don't give so that we can receive. We give because we have received. This is huge. Our giving is a response. If your giving is not a response, it will be difficult for you to give. But if something has happened in your heart that you understand how much God has done for you, it's so easy to say, Lord, what can I do? How can I thank you? 
You know, like recently some friends of ours, they said, why don't we come and stay in their house uh, in Cardiff, dog sit, cat sit, and they've got this incredible house in Cardiff. And so we're like living it up in this beautiful house with these awesome pets. Our kids don't have pets, so they get super excited about that. And so when we leave and we want to leave something for them, I'm not like, oh, I can't believe I have to give some money to these people. <laughs> right? It's like, it's so easy for me to give something as a response for what they have done, for their generosity. We have to understand <laughs> that God is the most generous being, the most generous personality in the universe. And when we have tasted and received from His generosity, we give as a response. This is why we give. What do we give? Here's a good one for us. Our lives. We give everything. Someone said, the gospel is free. It is. Receiving Jesus is free, but the response is giving everything back to him. You know, I heard uh, someone do research once about Olympic athletes and what they must do to train for the Olympics. These guys train upwards of six hours a day, some of them to 10 hours a day, six days a week to compete in the Olympics. Now you think that is crazy. A lot of these people, they do that in addition to working, in addition to a job, in addition to family life. And they train these crazy hours, something like another job, and you just think, that, that's ridiculous. But when you understand that competing in the Olympics and winning in the Olympics is one of the greatest honors that an athlete can experience, for them it is a reasonable sacrifice. It's rational. It's not crazy. It's like, I can compete in, in the Olympic Games. I can maybe win in the Olympic Games. I will do whatever it takes. And it's the same with giving ourselves as a living sacrifice. When we understand what an honor it is to give ourselves to this God, this creator, living God, that's given everything to us, that's given us life, given us the breath in our lungs, that's changed our destiny, that's changed our future, our eternity has been changed. It's rational. It's so reasonable. It's an accepti acceptable sacrifice to give our lives to him. And friends, let me just say that once we have given our lives to God, it's easy or easier to give our money to Him as well. Because if you're still, if some of the stuff is still yours, <laughs> it's more difficult. But when you understand, Lord, I've given you everything. And money is a good one because money is close to our hearts. It's good to talk about. I like to think that money is like a thermometer for the heart. Right? If you think you, you don't have enough, or you believe you might never have enough, we gather, right? We want to hold on to as much as possible. And there's a fear there. And we see this. We see this in the world. <laughs> there's a gathering spirit in the world. Hold on to as much as you can. But if you understand that you have a father who gives you more than enough, and you're filled with faith that he's going to provide for you and look after you, then there's a, a giving, a letting go, an openness, a generosity that flows from that. It's really in the heart that, that this originates from. And for whatever reason, I don't know, it's not our stomach, the food that we eat, and it's not even our jobs and our careers. For whatever reason, the wallet, pounds and pence, is the thing that's so close to our hearts. Right? It's like a thermometer. Like some people don't even want to put their wallets in their back pocket. They put it here, <laughs> close to their hearts. And it's a, great, it's a great measure for us. Can I? So we talk about money, but there's other things. Our time, our energy, you know, all of this is part of our lives. We give, you know, our efforts. We give our future. Like I might have dreamt to be an accountant, but God had something else for me. Or even a marine biologist, but God had something else for me. And that's okay because his future and his destiny is better for me than my future and my destiny is for me. So when I give him everything, 
I know it's in the best hands possible. And I'm not so worried about my time or my energy or my future or my money. Amen? Amen. You still with me? Why do we give? It's a response. Our giving is always a response because He has given. If we struggle with giving, go back to what He has done. Remind yourself of what He has done. Go to the cross again. Think of where you were. I like to think of where I was and the things I did and what God has saved me from. And that helps me. Oh, okay, my response, Lord, I want to give my life to you. What do we give? We give our lives. And then finally, how do we give? Many of us might have heard this a lot around here. We give out of revelation. We give radically by grace. We give regularly by faith. What is that? Is that just something we say every Sunday? Where does that come from? Let me just help us with this a little bit. We've, we've already answered the first question. We give out of revelation. It's a response because God has given. Revelation is a fancy word for understanding. I get it. That's why I do it. Now, if you don't get it, if you don't like giving, let me give you the permission to stop giving. Because we want, the scripture says, let no one give under compulsion. God loves a cheerful giver. And you can only be cheerful if you understand why. And if you don't, and if you do begrudgingly, rather just press the pause button on your giving and go back to trying to understand it. Okay? What other revelations are there? Giving is sowing. Again, 2 Corinthians 9 says that if you sow sparingly, you will reap sparingly. If you sow generously, you will reap generously. So this is a beautiful thing here. Okay, I don't give because I want to receive. I give because I have received. But when I give, I will receive even more. (laughs) Because it's an investment in the kingdom. It's like I give my kids pocket money, okay? We have four kids that need to have pocket I don't, like, I don't know how people do this with four children. I mean, I, I'm inspired by other people with four kids. But they get that pocket money. They don't have to do chores to get it. It's just a thing. That's how it works in our house. I know people do it differently. They can take that money and they can go to the corner shop and they can spend it all the same day that they receive it. And I know you know that some of them do that. Okay. (laughs) How much do I have in my rooster? Uh, 29 pence. (laughs) But I just got yesterday. Yeah, I know. Um, But they can also take that money and they can invest it in something. You know, they can take that money and they can uh, give it to me and I can put it in an investment, and that money can have a return that's going to keep on giving. They have received, and they give out of their, like one of the things that our kids do, our two daughters, they give to compassion, a compassion child. And, uh, and that money is investing. And that's going to have a return on it, a spiritual and a physical return. So I just want to say this to us, that we don't give so that we can receive, but if you do give, That money will keep on giving because it's something, it's seed in the ground. I've experienced this time and time and time again. That's why I love giving. I love talking about money. And and, and I I don't, I'm not asking you to do something or telling you to do something that I don't do myself. Okay, I believe in the vision of this church possibly more than anybody else. And I just want to say to you that as a family over the last 12 years, we have always been in the top five givers in this church. I'm not going to tell you or ask you to do something that we don't believe in, practice, and experience the blessing of ourselves. Amen? Last one is to give to the church. Uh Uh-oh. This is where the real offense comes in. What does the church do with the money? Where is it going? Are they even using it properly? That's a great question. You know, I've been in churches, many different churches before I led a church. Some churches definitely use their money better than other churches. What I can tell you is that you've got to let that go. You can't audit the church. You're never going to, you just got to trust Jesus. Now, I can explain this to you, and we can talk about this for four hours, 
But the fact of the matter is, God has asked us to be generous. God has asked us to invest. And the best place to, to invest, friends, is the church. Because the gospel, go read Ephesians 3, emanates from the church. The manifold wisdom of God is being made known from the church. Do I have it here? I do have it here. Again, the New Living Translation. This is Paul the Apostle. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, had kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all of this was to use the church, say church, church. to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. Jesus loves the church. He's working through the church. The gospel is working. Just look at the Ukraine and what God is doing through the church. Okay, this is his plan. Now, you might have a challenge with the church. Maybe not so much because you're here today (laughs) sitting in our service. But let me just ask you, trust God and trust his church and let it go. Don't audit the church. Say, Lord, it's yours and I give it to your church, and I trust that you're going to do something good. And if you belong here in this church, Every Nation Slough, uh, then do that. And if you don't trust this church, find one that you do. There are many other great churches around. But you're going to be faced with this challenge wherever you go. So, Lord, it's not me, it's you. So this is, talking about revelation, this helps us. Um, in our giving, giving is a response. I can't highlight this highly enough. Okay, Make sure that you know why and what God has done for you and let your giving flow from there. Giving is sowing. It's seed in the ground that will produce a harvest. Uh, and give to the church. Give to the church. That's revelation. Radically by grace. I love this. Uh, 2 Corinthians 8. Paul is writing here again. And he says... I want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. In severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. It's the only place I know in the Bible where we see affliction and joy in the same sentence and poverty and generosity. And the key is grace. Grace is the power of God to do what he has called us to do. Grace isn't just our excuse when we mess up. Grace is the energy that enables us, that launches us. And it is the grace of God that enables me to give and give radically. Now, here's a question. What does giving radically really look like? I'll leave that with you. Here's a question. In our giving every month, we have one amount that's about 1% of what we earn. We have one amount that's about 3% of what we earn. And we have one amount that's about 13% of what we earn. You've got to answer this question. Where is radical for you? Now, we see in the old, I'm not going to take much time to talk about this, but we see this thing of the tithe, right? We know if we've been in church for a while, if you follow Jesus for a while, you've come across this thing, the tithe. And there's this big question, is the tithe for today or isn't it? And I'm not going to go into that. For me, if the tithe, the the concept of the tithe helps you and blesses you, then go for it. If the concept of giving and radical giving helps you, go for it. But the tithe was 10%. And that was sort of through the Old Testament we see that. And one thing I know is that the new is always greater than the old. Don't limit yourself. Don't limit yourself to what God can do through you. At the end of your life, what is going to be a more important question? How much did I gather? Or how much did I give? Let's be those that are committed to receive the grace of God. 
to be radical. When someone sees our bank statement, like, whoa, that's radical. I'm going to get an email after this sermon. <laughs> Let's give regularly by faith. Again, whatever the Christian does, it's a walk of faith. By the way, if you want more detail, we only have half an hour here today, but if you want more detail, we have this series called Relationship Giving on our YouTube channel, Every Nation Slough. Go in a bit more detail, especially about the tithe, and I really believe it will help you with revelation and unlock generosity in you. But everything we do in the Christian life, we do by faith. The scripture says that the just or the righteous shall live by their faith. Okay? And so whatever it is that we do, we don't put our confidence in our performance. We don't put our confidence in our bank account. We put our confidence in God. And it is a lifestyle of faith. Um, it's when we pray, we pray from a place of faith. When we forgive someone, it takes faith to forgive someone. And it's the same with our giving. Okay, it takes faith. Okay, just because we understand why we want to give as a response doesn't always make it easy. Sometimes it's, Lord, just recently my wife challenged me um, to give to something which, which we felt called to give to. And I'm like, yeah, sure, let's, you know, let's give something. And Suzanne is always like, I'm like, okay, we're moving. <laughs> There's all sorts and it was, you know, that, that giving sometimes has got to come close to our hearts. It's like, Lord, I need faith here with us. But we give regularly, friends, by faith. Again, uh, Paul writes to the Corinthian church and he says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so you also are to do. On the first day of every week, each of you is to put something aside and store it up as he may prosper so that there will be no collecting when I come. This is a great practical truth for us. Give as you receive. So you might get an income once a year, once a month, once a week, sporadically. Just as you receive, set something aside. And friends, we can never wait until we receive a certain amount. Just decide, say, Lord, I'm going to trust you with 5%. Lord, I'm going to trust you with 15%. Whatever that is for you, you need to have that conviction from the Spirit, whether you earn 15 pounds or whether you earn 15,000 pounds. Let that be a principle. Lord, as I receive, I'm going to set something aside. And we can all be faithful, whether we have so much or so little, it takes faith. It takes faith to give, and I know that we're never going to give the big amounts if we don't start with the small amounts. Amen. Talking about money and giving. Friends, giving changes the world. It's my conviction because when God wanted to change the world, He gave. He gave Jesus for you and me so that our lives can be changed, so that our neighbors' lives can be changed, and, and that the world can be changed through us. How much more when we start giving our lives to Him? So, Lord, here I am. Use me. Again, think of the people in the Ukraine and the sacrifices that they're making because they've given their lives to the Lord. But each and every one of us, where we are today, we don't have to be in the Ukraine. We don't have to be in some poverty-stricken nation. Right here, we can give our lives. We can surrender today to God and say, use me for your purposes, for your kingdom. And it can change our worlds. Last week, we watched a video of a lady called Rima who gave her life to Jesus. She was baptized because people in this church, Nigel will tell you, they were doing exercises in a gym and they gave their lives to God, reaching out to this girl, spending time with her, building relationship with her, and that's why she's following Jesus today. Who knows what God can do through you and me? Our giving, our lives, our money. It changes the world. It's a response to God's giving to us. So finally, as we finish here, what do we do? We receive, number one. Okay, if you haven't received the gift of salvation, if you haven't received Jesus yet, today is such a good day to do that. It's the best decision you'll ever make. Receive God's provision. Friends, let's, let's not look at our employer as our provider God might use our employer, 
but let's see God's provision in our lives. Thank Him, acknowledge Him as the one who provides. And then we give. We give our lives, we give our money. An important opportunity right now is the Ukraine Relief Fund. So as we finish, we're going to take communion in a minute. We're going to just pray and and acknowledge God in all of this in a minute. But as we finish and as the service lands, both myself here with the tablet and Sam at the back there will be ready to help you activate your giving. One of the challenges we have with coronavirus is that we don't give physical money anymore. Okay, we don't want to, too many things to change hands. So all our giving is online at the moment. And if you've not had the opportunity, I'm just helping you put the word into practice here today. Thank you, Greg. You can sign up. You can give to the Ukraine Relief Fund. You can give regularly. You can set up regular giving to the church and trust God to use your money as you give to the church, to his kingdom. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are the great giver. Without you, we have nothing. Lord, there is no hope apart from you. There's no life. There's no future. God, we acknowledge you as the author and the finisher of everything in our lives. Father, I thank you for those of us that um, are just enjoying and in a season of blessing at the moment and feeling your breakthrough, God, in different areas, in areas of relationship or of finances or of our destinies, Father, our our calling. We just give you praise for that. But God, there are so many issues that we face, so many of us that haven't or don't see breakthroughs in specific areas and still believing you for a good outcome. And Father, we pray, show yourself strong on our behalf in Jesus' name. We pray for our families, God. We pray that salvation will come to our families. We pray for provision in our families, God. Radical provision that you will be our provider in every sense. Father, I pray for um, our relationships and that there will be strong reconciliation. There where there has been relational breakdown, will you bring reconciliation in Jesus' name? Father, those of us that are... uh, Asking questions about the future, about our destiny, about our calling, God. Will you speak clearly? Will you lead us by your grace? Father, we lift all of these things up to you. The challenging and the celebrating, the good and the difficult. We thank you, Father. You are the beginning and the ending, the Alpha, the Omega, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords.